you, thank you, Michael, my friend, yeah, for yeah. that introduction. Thank you, Stephen, for being here, and thank all of you for being here. And uh, I'm really I feel privileged and honored to be able to come into into St. John's and and talk about uh, what I offer. Um, and I am an interventionist. I'm a certified professional interventionist, and I've been facilitating interventions for about 14 years. Uh, I have a clinical background as a certified addictions counselor, uh, so there's a lot of education and clinical supervision that goes into attaining that certification, which uh, is part of my background. And uh, so I have, I have that. I'm also a recovering alcoholic. And so I know the disease of addiction from the inside now. I have, and I work very hard to keep up on, on current new information because we're gathering new education, uh, education and information all the time about addiction. And we're always trying to provide better treatment for addicts. Uh, so that's, that's who I am. And I'm here to talk to you tonight about the healing model of intervention, uh, which is the model that I work in. And I'm going to get into that further in, uh, in a little while. But uh, what I'd like to talk about first is some of the misconceptions or ideas that you might have that I'd like you to leave behind. There's a lot of bad information in the world today about what addiction is and about what treatment is and what it takes to get sober. There's just a lot of really bad information. And uh, so there's this idea that uh, alcoholics and addicts always need to hit bottom in order to get better. And that's very old school thinking. And uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a phrase, and they say you have the gift of desperation, where your life gets so uncomfortable and so painful that you're just desperate to get better. And certainly that helps an individual to get, uh, to get into recovery. But I'm not sure that it's necessary. I think it's necessary, uh, maybe if you're gonna, if you're gonna try and get into uh, recovery through a community-based based support group like Alcoholics Anonymous, I think desperation is a really good thing to have. But we have more intense, more supportive uh, modalities of therapy out there, and I'm, and I'm really not sure that desperation is all that necessary. Okay, so uh, also uh, the idea that interventions are always difficult and scary, interventions are betrayal, it's not true. Uh, the intervention process has been, I think, demonized uh, by popular media. There are television shows that depict the intervention process. And it's not about the truth. It's not about, uh, it's about drama and it's about conflict. And I've tried to watch that show. I tried, there's a show called Intervention. I've tried to watch it. I can never get through an, a whole session for a whole uh, episode. It makes me really angry uh, because of the, what they do to the people and how they, it's voyeuristic and, it's, and I think it's me. Uh, so, uh, the idea that interventions are only about getting somebody into treatment. We need to leave that behind too. There are some older models of intervention, the Johnson Institute model for instance, where really that was it. The intervention was about compelling an individual to accept treatment. That's an older model. And we've gotten much better at providing interventions today. And so I want to talk to you later about uh, some, of the other, uh, some of the other goals that we want to set for this process and we want to pursue. So these are the things I'd like you to leave behind. Okay. First of all, hitting bottom. So I used the Google, and I, I Googled bottom. And this is the definition that I came up with. And some of this stuff is just great, right? So we got uh, the lowest point or part. And then I have down here the uh, buttocks, rump, derriere, the fundamental posterior, the caboose, the duff, the hiney, 
right? So I'm not really sure what you mean when you say an addict or an alcoholic needs to hit bottom. I'm not sure what that means. I know that there's not a clinical definition for that term, hitting bottom. So these are some other things I found on the Google bottom, <laughs> right? Royal bottom. And then this one, hitting rock bottom. Rock bottom, you'll know it when you hit it, right? There are people in this room that are clinicians. Everybody in this room is a caring human being. Do we really want to let somebody get to that point in their life before we try and step in to help them? Is that necessary in order to get into recovery? And the answer is it's not necessary. You don't have to let them get that far. And then I'd like to know what bottom sounds like. What do you think is going on in this guy's head? Probably not much right now. But tomorrow morning, what do you think he's going to be thinking? What does rock bottom sound like to him? Does it sound like, uh, I'm so glad I finally hit rock bottom. It's a fine day to go to rehab, right? Do you think that's what that guy was thinking? And by the way, here's a kitten. Ain't life great, right? Or more likely what rock bottom sounds like. There's, there's a state of being that we call learned helplessness. Uh, it, and addiction, alcoholism, inflict learned helplessness upon alcoholics and addicts. And what learned helplessness is, is the idea that the decisions that I make in my life have no effect on my life. When I was drinking, that, that happened to me. I'd get up in the morning and I would decide with all of my will that I'm not going to drink today. And at 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm at the liquor store. So the decisions I made had no effect in my life. And that's what rock bottom is more likely to sound like. I'm an addict and I'm doomed. I am doomed to my addiction. I've tried to get sober before. I've tried everything I can think of and it doesn't work for me. So I know that there are some people that get into recovery, they're the lucky ones, but not me. I'm doomed. And my family would be better off without me. I got there, right? That's what rock bottom sounded like to me. And it sounded like that to me for a long time. And so the intervention process needs to improve and it needs to evolve. I work in a model of intervention called the Healing Model of Intervention. It was first created by a guy named Howie Madigan, who started doing interventions up in Boulder in the 1970s. Uh, and Howie was part of Harmony Foundation, uh, and, uh, and he was just a great guy. We lost him a few years ago. But he started this model of intervention back in the 70s. And back in the 70s, most people in Boulder needed an intervention. So he got a lot of practice. He started doing corporate structured interventions, so interventions for employers. And then he started working with families. And so uh, the, the model of intervention that I work in continues to evolve. Uh, like I said, I continue to uh, try and educate myself about new information about addiction and alcoholism and different modalities of, of therapy. And a few years ago, I met a guy named Jim Thomas, and Jim Thomas is an emotionally focused therapist, and he does a great job, and he works with something called attachment theory. And he invited me to have coffee with him. He had a family that needed an intervention, and he wanted to vet me before he referred to me. And so he sat with me for about 45 minutes, and he questioned me about how I go about this process. And at the end of that coffee, that, uh, that time together, he told me that what I was doing was emotionally focused work, and that I was working through attachment theory. And so then I started to read up on attachment theory. And, and understanding attachment theory in an emotionally focused therapy has made me a better interventionist, and it has helped this process evolve, and this process is going to get better. So, 
I want you to understand that, that interventions are not betrayals. Interventions are devotion. Oftentimes when families first start, start to work with me, they're afraid of the intervention because we're, we might be ambushing their loved one. We might walk into their house and, and ask them to sit down and talk to, them, talk to us without any forewarning. And they think it's betrayal. And it is not. That, that is devotion. That is risking my relationship in order to help somebody that I love. And we don't always ambush people. Oftentimes we invite them. So I work with the family and we prepare, I prepare with the family. And then we call our person of concern, our loved one, our addict or our alcoholic, and we say, we need to talk to you. We need to talk to you about what's going on in your life. And we're going to have a family meeting and we want you to be there. Or we're coming to your house, we'll be there in an hour. So we don't always ambush people. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we have to. The addiction has got such a grip on an individual that if they're afraid of a conversation with their family, then they'll run away. And so sometimes we do, but we do it out of devotion. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about intervention through the attachment theory, through the uh, lens of attachment theory. Attachment theory is kind of a concept of what it means to be a human being. And human beings are born with a lot of very powerful drives. We have desires that are innate, that are basic to our, our being. And there's a, there's a school of thought, of thought that says the most powerful drive that human beings experience is the survival drive. And then we have a procreative drive. And then we have an attachment drive. And then we have a protection drive. And they think that that's the order of importance. And I don't believe that. I think that the most powerful drive that we experience as human beings is the desire, the need to be in close, intimate, tr uh, supportive, safe, loving relationships with other human beings. Attachment theory came to fruition at the end of World War II. There were a lot of orphans and not enough nurses. And so those orphans were provided for physically. Their needs to survive were met. They were nourished, they were clothed, they were kept clean, and they were kept warm. And they died at an alarming rate. They called it failure to thrive. And we now know that in order for an infant to survive and to thrive, it needs skin-to-skin -skin contact with another human being. It needs a human being mimicking facial expressions, making eye contact, cooing to the child, loving the child, nurturing the child. That's our most powerful desire. So attachment drive is fundamentally what it means to be human. We do not succeed at anything in and of ourselves, and we need other human beings to survive. Dr. Sue Johnson wrote a book called Love Sense, and it's about attachment theory and relationships. And in the opening paragraphs of that book, she has some great uh, quotes. At, at one point, she says, love makes us vulnerable, but we are never as safe and as strong as when we know we are loved. Isn't that true, right? If you love somebody who's an alcoholic, you know what it means to be vulnerable. They hurt you, and you can't get away from them. You can't abandon them, and they hurt you some more. And if you didn't love them, you wouldn't be vulnerable and they wouldn't hurt you so much. So when you love an addict or an alcoholic, you're vulnerable. <coughs> Dr. Johnson goes on to say that we know at the darkest moments of our lives, nothing but contact with those that we love will do. And I think that's very insightful into what it means to be a human being. When I'm down, when I'm broken, I seek out the people that I love my family, my friends, and I ask them to take care of me. That's not true if you're an alcoholic. When I was an alcoholic, this is what I loved. John Jameson Irish whiskey right there. I would walk past my family in order to get there. 
alcohol stole my attachment drive. And we know how it happens. We have a lot of information about alcoholism nowadays that we didn't have just five years ago or 10 years ago. There are some great resources. There is a DVD called Pleasure Unwoven, and it is by a gentleman named Dr. Kevin McCauley. And he explains what happens to the central nervous system as someone becomes addicted to a chemical. Great Courses has a, has a book, uh, books on tape, and there's a book called The Addictive Mind by Thaddeus, Professor Thaddeus Polk. Great information on what, it, what happens when somebody becomes addicted. And I could spend the next hour talking to you about this, and I'd only get halfway through it. But we know that chemically and physically, when somebody becomes addicted to a chemical, their neural pathways and their brain chemistry change. And the addiction steals the attachment drive. So I now no, no longer love the people that I love. I love alcohol more. Alcohol becomes the most powerful relationship in my life. And so through an intervention, what we want to do is get the attachment drive back. Take it back from the, from the chemical, from the addiction, and point it back where it really belongs, to the family, to the loved ones, right? So some of the older models of intervention had a couple of goals. One of those goals was, in the Johnson Institute model, we're going to compel a person, the person of concern, to accept treatment appropriate to their needs. We will compel an addict to accept treatment. We will push them into treatment. Uh, and uh, to protect the relationships. So the Johnson Institute model says we want to protect the relationships. This is an older model and we can do better. And we do do better. So the healing model of intervention, our first goal is to protect the relationships and to offer those relationships an opportunity to grow and to heal. The relationships become the first goal. And if we, can, if we can pursue that goal, and if we can attain that goal, then treatment becomes easier, usually. Recently, I was involved in an intervention with a family, and it was an old, a, a gentleman and his adult children and his wife his daughter-in-law, and we were in an office together, and he came into the room, and, and we started talking to him about going to treatment. Uh, and at first he said, I can't go, I'm not gonna go to inpatient treatment, I'm not gonna do that. Drinking's a problem. I'll go to some AA meetings. I'll meet with my pastor, and I'll get better. And that wasn't gonna work for this gentleman. He needed more. And so what happened in that room is I asked his son to read a letter to him, an intervention letter. Now an intervention letter is a therapeutic tool and it is designed to create a significant change of emotion and perception within the person who hears it. So his son had written a letter to, to dad and he read that letter to dad. And I watched dad as he heard that letter. And at the end of the letter, it was quiet for a few seconds. And I said to Dad, I was watching you. Something happened to you when you heard that letter. What happened to you? Dad said, a lot of pride. And then his voice cracked, and he said, a lot of shame. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah. Uh, I externalized the problem which is a really cool technique that we can use in interventions. So I said to dad, you're not the problem in this family. This family loves you. They're grateful for you. They need you. You're not the problem. The alcoholism is the problem. Dad nodded his head up and down. I said, why are you okay with what alcoholism is doing to your family, to you and to your son? He said, I'm not okay with that. I said, Dad, what do you think it cost your son to read that letter to you? Dad said it cost him a lot. I said, what are you thinking? 
Dad said, I think I should go to treatment. So we didn't get into conflict at all in that intervention. It was just about reestablishing those relationships, bringing them back into focus for this gentleman, and he went to treatment. So then what we want to do is we want to help the person of uh, concern to give voice to their pre-existing motivation to change. I work with families all the time, and one of the first pieces of information I give them is I say, your loved one already wants to go to treatment. They already want to go. The problem is that they're conflicted. So there's a small, sane voice in their, in their, in their head, and that voice says, I'm struggling, I need help, I need to go to treatment. The problem is there's a louder voice that says, no, you can't go to treatment. Just keep doing what you're doing. One more month, one more week, one more day. Just keep doing what you're doing. And so we don't need to compel most individuals to accept treatment. All we have to do is help them find that pre-existing motivation. It's already there. We need to provide them with an environment where they feel safe and understood and loved and supported so they can give voice to that motivation. And then we say, we got the plan already in place for you. All you need to do is say yes, and we got it all figured out. We got a plane ticket. We got a bed available. We know who's going to drive you. Everything's taken care of. So then we want to have concern for the emotional well-being of the subject, the person who's going to treatment. We could be over, overpowering. We could use guilt and shame to really push an individual to accept treatment. We could be forceful, and we might even be successful that way. And I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes we end up there. Sometimes, despite our best efforts at being gentle and being loving and being understanding, we need to push. We need to give them a shove, right? And, and, I, and I help do that. But we want to be concerned for their emotional well-being as they go to treatment. So if we use guilt and we use shame and we're angry and we're forceful, we might get them in the car going to treatment, feeling like a loser. And, and that poor guy, that poor young woman has already felt like a loser and they felt like a loser for a long time. And it doesn't, and it hasn't done them any good. Or we can be loving and understanding and patient. We can remind them of how important they are to this family. We can remind them of, of successes they've had in the past of the attributes that they've been given as a person. And we can say to them, with all of these gifts you've been given as an individual, with the love and support of this family, with the right professional help, you will succeed. So we can push against that learned helplessness in the intervention. We can start pushing against that. And maybe we can get them in the car going to treatment, believing in themselves believing that they can succeed, having been reminded that they're loved. Maybe we can get them into the, into the car going to treatment, grateful for the people that showed up to help them. I've been accused of being a storyteller, so I'm going to tell you some stories, okay? A number of years ago, I was invited to do an intervention for a gentleman who is an assistant district attorney. I'm not going to tell you where, but he was an assistant district attorney. And 18 people showed up to be on his intervention team. 18. Typically, it's four to eight people. So these were family members and friends and colleagues. And we went through a training together. To prepare for an intervention, we go through two trainings together. At the end of the first training, I give the team members homework. I send them home with an outline, and I say, you're going to write an intervention letter. And I give them an outline, and the outline says, tell them that you love them here, and here, and here, and tell them you really love them here, and you need them, and you love them, and you're hurting, 
and tell them all of those things. And then in the second session, we all get together and we start to read our letters out loud to each other. So we're in the second session. The team members are reading their letters. I noticed that friends and colleagues have no problem telling this guy that they love him. We love you. You're a great guy. Family members say, we respect you, we admire you, we support you. But they don't say the word love. And so I challenge the family members and I ask them, where's, where's the love in your letters? And they said, we love him. Of course we love him, but we don't say that word in our family. Our grandparents didn't use it. Our parents didn't use it. We don't use it. If you make us say it, it's going to sound fake. Please don't make us say it. I said, OK. So we got into the intervention the next day. And this gentleman was smart. He was upset. He was angry with me. He referred to me as smart guy. Uh, but we got him to listen to the letters. And he said, I can't go to treatment. I'm not going. Three letters in to this intervention, he said, I'll go. He said, I'll probably lose my job, but I'll go. We got to tell him that his job is protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act, and he wasn't going to lose his job. And we had attained one of our goals. He accepted treatment, but we could still pursue other goals. So we wanted to pursue healing the relationships, and we wanted to pursue giving him back his belief in himself as a successful human being. I asked him if he'd listen to the rest of the letters to pursue those goals. He said, I will. I said, whose letter would you like to hear next? He said, you've got this all scripted, smart guy. Why don't we just go with the order of the letters that you've already established? And so I looked at my list, which I had laying on my leg, because 18 people's a lot. And I had, a, I had cheat notes, right? I had a crib note. And so I said, your brother's next. His brother read him his letter. At the end of the intervention letter, rather than saying, please go to treatment, his brother said, thank you. Thank you for accepting treatment. I can now see a future where my best friend's a part of my life again. The alcoholic said, thank you, I love you. In a family where they don't use that word, right? So if we can get that, why would we stop at just, yes, I'll go to treatment? We want to improve functionality in the family. <clears throat> Here's something I run into all the time. Families will call me and I'll come into their lives and I'll start to talk to them about addiction and intervention. And they will say to me, and they're often, time, often they're heartbroken, uh, we're a dysfunctional family. I'm an enabler. I'm a codependent. And, and I really dislike the term dysfunctional family the way we use it in our culture today. In our culture, when we say dysfunctional family, we imply that most families are fully functional. That we're the only mess on the block. Everybody else is doing fine. And of course, that's, that's not true. There's no such thing as a fully functional family. There isn't. Families have different levels of functionality in different arenas of life. I've worked with some families who are just great at managing wealth and getting their kids good educations, but they're horrible at displays of affection. And I've worked at other families who are great at displays of affection, but horrible at, at education. When it comes to alcoholism or addiction, there's no such thing as a fully functional family. No such thing. I don't care how much, I know a lot about alcoholism. Uh, I come from a large Irish family, more than one alcoholic in my family. And sometimes in the past they've come to me and they've asked for help. And they want me to be an addictions counselor, or they want me to be their sponsor in AA. And I can't do it. I cannot take myself out of the role of uncle or cousin or sibling and be their therapist. I can't do it. Right? But I can become more functional. 
So if a family goes through uh, an intervention process, they should get some education about what addiction is, what alcoholism is. They should have an experience so that they know that they can be affected. It's not hopeless. It's not, they're not helpless. They can be affected, but they need some support and they need some direction. And that increased functionality should be enduring. That should go into the future. Folks, we're not getting better at, at, uh, at avoiding addiction in our culture. We're getting worse at avoiding addiction. We're creating more addictive chemicals. We're putting them out there in the pharmacies and we're telling doctors they're safe and they are not. We are, so we're, we're becoming a more addictive society and that's just my opinion. And so this information should be passed from one generation to the next to help this family, one family at a time, be better equipped to recognize addiction, to avoid addiction, to deal with addiction in the future. Okay, so as we pre prepare, as I prepare a family for an intervention, the first thing I do is education. What is addiction? And uh, because addiction is a lot of things. Uh, it's a physical disease. It's a psychological disease. It's an emotional disorder. It's a dependency. You know what it feels like to the family? is abandonment. It doesn't feel like a disease to them. It feels like loss. It feels like the, a broken attachment, a broken relationship. I don't know how many times I've had families say to me, I don't recognize that person anymore. I don't recognize my child anymore, my spouse anymore. I don't recognize my sibling anymore. They're walking and talking, but I don't recognize them. So those folks have been stuck in a, in a place of grief and loss for a long time. They've lost somebody, but they're not allowed to grieve for them because they're right there. I can hear them snoring in the bedroom, but they're lost. And so if we can, so we educate the family about what addiction is. There are a couple of symptoms of alcoholism and addiction that stand in the way of an individual, of a struggling individual from accepting treatment. If this guy was having a heart attack, he'd be begging the EMTs to put him in the ambulance and get him to the hospital. But he's got alcoholism or drug addiction, chronic, primary, progressive, potentially terminal disease. And he says, I don't want help. I don't want help. And why is that? So if we can understand the disease, we can understand denial, which is a very real symptom. We can understand delusional thinking, which is an emotional disorder. And if we can overcome those, we can help them accept treatment. So if we understand the disease, and it sets us up to overcome those symptoms. There's some training for the family. You need to know how to write an intervention letter. It's a therapeutic tool. Not only do you need to know how to write one, you need to know why we write it in this, in this fashion. Why do we do it this way? So there's training there. There's training in some therapeutic method. So I talk to families about body language. How do you sit when you're doing an intervention? How do you sit? So this doesn't work for us, right? This doesn't work. This doesn't work for us. What works for us, just stretch my legs out and relax. Cross my feet at the ankles. I'm not a threat to you. I just want to talk. I pretend I'm holding a big basket of bread in my lap, which is a really great way to talk to somebody. This means I want you to listen to me, but I want to hear from you, too. I talk to them about eye contact. How do you manage eye contact in an intervention? What happens if you're looking at your loved one, our, our addict, or alcoholic, or person of concern? What if you're engaged with them, and they're giving you the old stick eye, and I'm mad at you? How do you handle that? 
But what do you do if they're giving you the sad puppy dog eyes? Which is, alcoholics are great at the sad puppy dog eyes. How do you manage that, right? I talk to family members about tone of voice. Because voice is a tool. And what we want to do is use our voice to reach out and touch somebody. And they, to make sure, that, to let them know that they're safe and they're understood and they're loved. So our voice needs to be soft and our cadence needs to be slow. So there's a lot of training involved. There's a lot of planning involved. There's a lot of structure to this model of intervention. But I do not have an off-the-rack intervention. It is not a one-size-fits-all world. Right? So I, I already gave you an example about one of the decisions we need to make in planning and in, in intervention. Do we invite them or do we surprise them? There are risks and benefits to either way we go. The risk of inviting somebody to, the, to an intervention is that they won't show up. They'll run away. Or they will show up, but they'll be ready for us. They will have entrenched themselves and their defenses will be in place. The benefit is we treat them honorably. And, and if we treat them honorably, we're going to require that they behave honorably. So, so there's a benefit. What's the risk of surprising somebody? I've, I've sat in rooms and done interventions where people have said, you're right, I'm in trouble, and I go to treatment except you guys betrayed me. You snuck up on me. And if you would have just called me and asked me to talk to you about this, I would have been happy to go to treatment. But since you surprised me, I'm not going. They say that, and it makes sense to them. Right? So that's, that's the risk. The benefit is we're more likely to get them in the room. They won't have entrenched themselves. They won't have their defenses in place. So that's a decision that the family needs to make. I can help with that decision, but ultimately that decision belongs to the family. Right? So there are a lot of, there's a lot of planning involved. Who sits where in relationship to our person of concern? Whose letter goes first? How do we overcome the objections? If they say, well, uh, if I go to treatment, who's, what's going to happen with my dog? You cannot send somebody to treatment and tell them that their dog is going to the Dumb Friends League. It doesn't work, right? Somebody has got to be ready to take care of their dog for them. And you need to have 40 pounds of, of Iams dog food in your trunk. And you need to be ready to show it to them. I'm taking your dog, I'm feeding your dog, right? So there's a lot of planning involved. The last thing that we do is therapy. This is a therapeutic process for the family for a couple of different reasons. When you love an addict, when you love an alcoholic, you get hurt. You get sick. You become a hostage of their disease. When you start keeping secrets for an addict or an alcoholic, you are a hostage of their disease. And you get sick. And you deserve to be cared for. You deserve to be in a better place. That's one of the reasons we do some therapy. The other reason is because if you're going to sit in a room with an addict or an alcoholic and you are going to have a discussion with them about giving up their substance, about stepping away from the life that they have with their addiction, it's a really good idea to be emotionally grounded. Not only as an individual, but as a group. So we want a very cohesive, strong family at the end of the training. So then there's the event, the, 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 uh, the intervention. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. I'm going to talk to you about the opening ceremony, right? So it doesn't matter whether we choose to surprise an individual or whether we choose to invite them to their intervention. Chances are their anxiety is going to be pretty high when they walk in that, in that room. And anxiety doesn't work for us. I'm an alcoholic. I know what makes anxiety go away. John Jameson Irish whiskey. 
Anxiety doesn't work for us. What works for us is can we help them feel safe and calm so that they can have a genuine discussion with us and be present with us and be vulnerable with us as we have this talk. So this is how you start an intervention. You hug them. You hug them. And it's not your usual hug. It's not your man hug, for sure, which is this, one or two pats between the shoulder blades, and then get away from me. We don't do that. It might not even be your typical family hug. We hug them, and we hold them, and we wait for them to start to pull away from our embrace. And then we whisper to them, stay here for a minute. Stay here. I'm scared. I want to hold on to you. And you hold them. And you let them go. And you pass them to the next family member. And they do that to them. They hug them. Stay here. I need to hold on to you for a minute. It's hard to be angry if your family does that for you. It's almost impossible to run away when your family does that for you. So that's the way we greet them. We embrace them and then we sit down. Then I introduce myself and I do it with a lot of respect. I say, hi, I'm Stephen Wilkins. I offer to shake their hands. I'm just here with your family. We need to talk to you. And of course, sometimes our person of concern is talking during the opening ceremony. And they might say something like, what's going on here? And I might say, I think you know. Or they might say, oh, is this an intervention? And then we're going to say, it is. It's your lucky day. This is one that I love. I knew this was going to happen. I knew you guys were doing this. And then we get to say, and you came anyway. Thank you. Thank you for showing up. I, I introduce them. I get them to sit down. I sit down across from them, I stretch my legs out. I show them that I'm relaxing. I move my shoulders and I relax. I take a breath and I hope that they follow me. And I start to talk to them. As I said, my name's Stephen Wilkins and I've been working with your family for a long time to get ready to talk to you today. We've spent a lot of hours and done a lot of very hard work to get ready to talk to you. And we need to talk to you about the drinking. We need to talk to you about the drug abuse. Then I ask them to look at the family. I need you to look at them. They're fragile right now. All of that work that we did has made them very vulnerable. And they're fragile and they're vulnerable. And so I'm going to ask you to be gentle with them. Will you do that? And I want them to answer me. Yes, I'll be gentle. Then I give them permission to be fragile. I can't tell them that they're fragile. Even if they're crying and shaking, I can't say, you're a mess, because they'll fight with me. <laughs> and they'll say, no, I'm not. I have allergies. <laughs> and sometimes they throw in a couple of those F-bombs right there. Right? <laughs> yeah, screw you. I have allergies. So I give them permission to be fragile. You've been having a hard time in your life. All of that work that we've done is so that we can be gentle with you. But we need to talk to you about the drinking, the drug use. We have some really good ideas for you. Your family members have written letters. I want you to listen to these letters with an open mind and with some respect. And we'll see what we can get done for you today. And they hear an intervention letter. And at the end of the intervention letter, there's a question. Will you accept a gift from us? Will you go to treatment today? And then we are going to negotiate. So those letters are about connection, about reestablishing relationship. And in between the letters, we're going to negotiate with them. I want them to tell me why they can't go to treatment. I want them to tell me why they think it's a bad idea. It's a great idea. There's no reason for them not to want to go to treatment. They, have, they think there are reasons. Those reasons are delusional in nature. They are delusional thoughts. And I want them to express their delusional thinking. As soon as they start objecting to treatment, they've joined our team. 
right? So they say, uh, just in as, a, as an example, uh, the 30-year-old failure to launch child who's living in mom and dad's basement, and there are a few of them in this neighborhood, just like every other neighborhood across the country. Those, those kids are in the basement. And they are drinking beer and they are smoking pot and they are draining mom and dad dry. And they will say, you're right, I drink too much. But mom, dad, I can't take money from you. And now they become an honorable individual. I can't take money from you. It's too expensive. And so then the family will be coached and they will say, it's a gift, we want you to have it. You remember what it means to buy a gift to somebody? for somebody, right? So we want you to have this. And that might move them past their objection or it might not. So then they say, thanks for the gift, but it's too much money, can't take it. Mom says it's a gift for me too. Did you know that I get out of bed two or three times a night? I walk to the head of the basement stairs, I listen. If I can hear you breathing, I know you're okay and I can go back to sleep. If you go to treatment, I get to sleep the whole night without having to check on you. And that's my part of the gift, and I want my gift to give it to me. And that might move them off the objection, it might not. Thanks, Mom. I've heard this, folks, I've heard this. Well, Mom, you have an anxiety problem, maybe you should get a prescription for some sleeping pills. Right? That's your problem, not mine. I can't go to treatment. Dad says, sign an IOU. You're a smart kid. Stop drinking, stop using drugs. Get a job, you can pay me back. I won't even charge you interest. Here's an IOU. Dad, thanks, but it's too much of an imposition. I can't take that money from you. Then I'm the bad guy. I'm the only bad guy in an intervention ever. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to change my body language, I move forward, I get in their space a little bit, and I say, here's the deal. Money comes and goes. Life only goes. Keep doing what you're doing, and your, and these, your family's going to have to pay for a funeral. Treatment is cheaper than a funeral, and we're only talking about money here. Can you imagine the emotional cost your family will pay if you keep doing what you're doing? And then I shut it down. This is a silly discussion. We won't be having this discussion anymore. We are moving on. In between the letters, I want to negotiate with them for as long as possible until they start to get angry or shut down. Then they have another letter. Until they say yes, right? So when they say yes, I'll go to treatment, we celebrate. We hug them. We thank them. We settle back down and I say, your family would like to read the rest of these letters to you. And I tell them why. To continue to heal these broken relationships. We want to read these letters to you. There's a part of the letter that describes your destructive behavior. We're going to skip that. Will you listen to the rest of the letters? I will. And then we, so we finish up here in all of the letters. And really they're, they're big sticky valentines is what they are except for that one part of the letter where I ask you to describe the addict's destructive behavior and how it's hurt you. We might go through all of the letters and they say, no, I'm not going to treatment. And then if the family wants to, we can go into the consequence phase where, and here's how that works. It's really hard to be an alcoholic and an addict without the support of other people. It's almost impossible. And so if the family is willing to, if they want to, I will help them remove their support, pull it away. So parents might change their behavior in order to protect themselves from a child's addiction. Moms can say, no more money. Because if I give you money, you go to the liquor store, or you go to the dope man, and you go to your dealer and you buy drugs. No more money. You can't drive my car anymore because you're a menace, because you're dangerous, because there are children in the world and you drive drunk all the time. You can't drive my car anymore. You can't live in my basement anymore. Moms can say those things. Moms cannot say I won't feed you. 
because that's a lie. And so we do not lie in an intervention. And I help families deliver that message if they want to, if that's something they want. And so sometimes at the end of the event, the addict's not in treatment, but the family's healthier. So now this family has chosen to get, he to get healthier without the addict. And sometimes two or three days later, or a week or two later, the phone rings and the disenfranchised addict or alcoholic now says, I need to go to treatment. Right? At the end of all of this, we solidify the, we solidify the event. Right? Um, recently, I was, I was touring a treating agency and I was talking to the director of this treating agency and he said about 10% of our patients leave treatment against medical advice. 10%. And I thought, wow. In the last 14 years, I've, I've facilitated almost 700 interventions. And I've had four people leave against medical advice. So not only does the intervention process get them there, it motivates them to stay there and to complete. So we want to solidify that. And what that might mean is they've said, yes, I'm going to go to treatment, but the family wants to give them the message, you have to complete. If you don't complete, you can't come home. If you don't complete, we're going to ch uh, protect your children from your addiction. So we make it solid. And then we transport it to the treating agency. Uh, oftentimes, I help with that. Uh, other times the family, I'm not needed. Uh, again, if, there's, if we need to have a bad person in the intervention, I'm the, always the bad guy. I'm always the bad cop. And so it's never happened, not once, at the end of an intervention have I said, and who do you want to take me, take you to treatment, and have the, have the addict say, well, I'm really mad at them, I want you to take me now. Never once has that happened. And I don't want it to happen. I might get in the car with them. Uh, if it's a long distance transport, I'm probably doing it. I'm getting on a plane with somebody, I'm flying them somewhere. Uh, but usually the family can handle it and the family doesn't need me. Sometimes I follow just to make sure everything goes okay. We get them where they're going. My commitment to the intervention hasn't ended yet. Uh, I still have, I, as I go through that intervention process, I gather a lot of really important information from the family. The family history, the family dynamic, the individual's history. So I have a lot of really good information, which I can pass on to the treating agency to enable them to create the best possible individualized treatment plan. Here's what happens when you go into treatment. The first thing they do is assessment. And a lot of the assessment is in the form of an interview. So they sit down and they have some pretty cool, effective tools and they ask you to answer some questions and they try and figure out what's been going on in your life. Now a little while ago I told you I'm a recovering alcoholic. And so it's politically okay for me to say what I'm about to say. Alcoholics and addicts lie. We lie all the time. We don't tell the truth about what's been going on in our life. And so it's difficult to get a good solid assessment. I have objectively gathered tr uh, information on their history, which I put in, the, in an intervention summary and I hand that to the treating agency within one or two days after somebody enters into treatment. And the treating agencies love those files. Now they have a lot of very accurate information. And they get that information at the onset of treatment, not two weeks later, not three weeks later. It helps. It helps. I'll stay on as a resource to the treating agency. I'll stay on as a resource to the family. So oftentimes I, uh, the families have questions about what's going on in treatment. I can explain it with a little bit more clarity. I can continue to pass information back and forth. On a couple of occasions, I've been asked to come back into the treating agency and reaffirm our intervention. So they want to leave after a couple of weeks, and I roll in and I say, you really got to stay. And, and usually that's effective. It works. 
So that's what I do. Um, questions? Yes? Um, usually with the rehab um, situation, is it common that you know rehab will take the first time, or is it sometimes an ongoing event where you have to go back to rehab? Okay, oftentimes people have more than one episode of treatment for addiction. That doesn't speak badly about the, inner, about the individual. It doesn't say they're weak or, or corrupt or bad people. It doesn't speak badly about the family. It speaks to the disease. Addiction is a chronic disease. Chronic means characterized by relapse and remission. Chronic means cannot be cured, but some chronic diseases, and addiction is one of them, can be treated. There's a really interesting statistic about, uh, about episodes of treatment, and what it says is that if somebody makes a 90-day concerted effort to get out of an addicted lifestyle, and we check on 90 days, that doesn't mean 90 days inpatient. It might mean 30 days inpatient followed by extended care followed by IOP, uh, 30 days inpatient followed by uh, 60 days of an AA meeting every day. And we check on them five years later, 28% of those people will still be in recovery. The rest have relapsed once or twice or may have gone into a full-blown relapse. Some of them will make a second attempt at getting into recovery, a second 90-day concerted effort. What do you think their success rate is? 28% for the first one, what do you think the second one is? 28%. Third effort, 28%. Fourth effort, 28%. The lesson, I think, is optimistic. Don't give up. Don't give up. It's a chronic disease. Try again. You miss something. Okay. Any other any other questions? There are some folks here from other treating agencies. Steve Latour is here. Uh, Paige is here, and she is from Origins. And I forgot your Jen Place. Jen is here from Cedar, and so everybody here we're happy to give you a lot of information, answer any questions you have. I am I'm really thrilled that you showed up. And again, it was an honor and a privilege to be able to talk to you about what I do. You, you can ask my wife, I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.